In this section, we're going to discuss 3D imaging, axial and multi-slice helical uh, aspects of CT. In terms of the configurations, at the axial configuration that we discussed in our uh, introductory lectures in previous units uh, has been superseded clearly by helical scanning. Now we've already discussed some of the basic, basic aspects of helical scanning, but the aim of this fourth year content is to flesh out uh, in more detail some of the discussions that we've previously had and uh, to build around some of the mathematical basis of these details. So the axial scanning we know is used sometimes uh, in limited, limited applications but has largely been superseded by helical scanning. So some of the axial applications include uh, scanning of the temporal bones, the lungs and also uh, cardiac gated CT. The helical scanning has significant benefits in terms of its uh, faster um, and increased flexibility but there is a level of increased complexity because we have to do some rebinning of the data uh, before we can do the reconstruction. So as you know the helical scanning relies on the fact that the bed moves uh, whilst the scan is in progress uh, so that gives us increased Z coverage. Now as we've gone from single slice helical to multi slice helical um, and expanded out the divergence of the beam in the z-axis we've got more and more uh, towards um, cone beam CT. So cone beam CT is very much the extreme of helical scanning however there is a further significant difference in that the, the detector that's used is typically a flat panel detector in cone beam CT rather than the increased size of the arc detector that's used in uh, helical scanning. As we've moved to multi-slice helical scanning, some of the reconstruction issues have got more complicated. So if we're going to use gantry tilt, say to avoid um, scanning the eyes, then uh, the, the problem with multi-slice helical scanning over single-slice helical scanning is that um, we have this variability in the isocenter. So we know um, from our previous discussions that the isocenter plays a very important role in terms of all of our quantities are defined at the isocenter of the scanner as we have a divergent beam. Now a divergent beam by its nature means that the size of things, there's a, there's a degree of magnification in there and therefore the size of things varies as we move uh, with increasing distance from the source towards the detector. So it's important that we account for this uh, in our reconstruction process. Now, in terms of the, the scan volume, our axial scanning, we, we previously talked about uh, a, a patient index. Um, and we said that when our patient index is equal to our slice thickness, we have contiguous slices, meaning that the slices are all uh, one after the other with no overlap. And we know that if our patient index is less than or greater than our slice thickness, we're either going to have... Um, overlap or we're going to need to do interpolation. So in order to flesh this out mathematically in a bit more detail we, we can relate this back to the Nyquist theorem. So we know the Nyquist theorem says that we need to sample at least twice our separation in order to um, give us our accurate reconstruction of our detail. So the slice thickness is typically about 0.7 millimetres in uh, current generations of clinical CT scanners. That we, we can uh, go down to about 0.3 to 0.4 um, millimetres in extreme cases. Uh, however, for uh, the, the bulk of the, the work that's done clinically, we're looking around the 0.7 millimetre mark. Now, as we said, Axial scanning was used a, uh, a lot previously, historically, uh, and we talk about it in terms of the reconstruction because we often take our helical data and talk of, talk of it in terms of rebinning it into a, an axial configuration so that we can then do the reconstruction. And we'll see exactly why that is. Now, there are three key advantages of helical scanning. The first of which is we get complete organ coverage uh, in a single breath hold and we can do that because that allows us to vary our pitch. Now clearly we couldn't do this in uh, uh, axial scanning mode. So the 
the fact that we have uh, this increased sampling means that we get um, we can reconstruct slices at arbitrary locations. So if you remember, for our axial scanning configuration, at any given Z location, we had all of our 360 degrees of data. But now, because the patient bed is totally uh, is moving continuously while this, the scan is ongoing, we don't have all of our data at one, all of our angular data at one Z, but we have some angular data at each Z. So it's the data spread out on that theta versus Z plot. Uh, another advantage is that we can then uh, reproduce overlapped images without actually overlapping the scan, just by going back and uh, selecting the data in the way that we, we require. So, one, one thing to note though is that even if we have a pitch of 1, it does not mean that there are no gaps in Z. Because of the divergent nature of the beam, uh, clearly as I said previously, uh, as we move from the source towards the detector, we have this degree of divergence, which means that we therefore have uh, overlap towards the uh, detector surface and um, gaps towards the source. So, if we remember our discussion of the Fourier slice theorem, uh, we need to have all of our data uh, at, a, uh, at one Z in order for us to be able to um, use that projection data to do a reconstruction. Now if you think about it, if we're doing a helical scan, the position of the fan beam uh, at the Z, the, the Z location at the start of one rotation is different to the position at the uh, uh, once the, the table is finished moving following a complete rotation. So we need to address this. And the way that we do that is that we choose uh, a plane, and in, in its simplest approximation we can choose a plane that's halfway between the start location and the stop location following one complete rotation. And then we can interpolate the data onto that plane. Therefore we will then have effectively um, analogous to uh, our axial scan data where at a given Z location, at this equidistant point, we now have all of our um, 360 degrees of rotation projection data with which we can do the reconstruction. And we discussed interpolation uh, previously. Now we can also be more sophisticated than that and our, um, our reconstruction plane doesn't have to be equidistant. We can reconstruct at arbitrary locations and um, we can all incorporate data so that we have a thickness to that plane uh, and therefore optimize for noise performance. So the simple form of the uh, acquisition and reconstruction process that we've covered previously is a flowchart that looks something like this. We start off with intensity data, we use our I0 data at our edge channels where there's uh, no obstruction by the patient. We can convert our intensity data then into uh, attenuation data that attenuation data can then be reconstructed and then once we've reconstructed that we can visualize it. Now as we've uh, followed on in this discussion we know we now have uh, a fan beam data and we also have um, helical data. So the, 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 the fan beam data and the helical data um, we can apply weightings and interpolations to in order to correct that. So the, the fan beam, beam data can effectively be corrected back to the parallel data and that um, the, the helical data can be uh, interpolated back to be um, on a single plane. So we can effectively then just go back to our simplistic uh, discussion of uh, reconstruction. Provided we account for these things, we can go back to our um, straightforward way of understanding how the reconstruction process works because we've always discussed the reconstruction previously in terms of having uh, all of our parallel rays on a single plane. Now there are more advanced uh, mathematical descriptions of how the reconstruction process works but uh, for this course um, we're going to keep going with the uh, straightforward description. So the, we've, we've talked about the scan volume in terms of 
uh, what happens in the XY plane. But now in terms of the Z plane, we can characterize our uh, distribution in, in terms of a slice sensitivity profile. So we've previously met the modulation transfer function uh, and also uh, the point spread function as descriptors of how to characterize the resolution of a system. Uh, here we're going to discuss the slice sensitivity profile in some more detail. So the in terms of the, uh, the Z resolution of our system, that's going to be affected by the size of the detector channels in the Z direction in the same way it does in the XY direction, the size of the focal spots in the Z direction in the same way as in the XY direction. Also the uh, collimation of the um, uh, penumbra and also uh, how we collect the data is going to affect our ultimate resolution. If we don't sample adequately we're not going to be able to get high uh, resolution reconstructions as was discussed previously in terms of the Nyquist criteria. So the slice sensitivity profile looks typically something like a Gaussian or a trapezoid. So uh, in, in terms of our uh, axial scanner we typically talk about the slice sensitivity profile which is the, the, the sensitivity of the system in the Z direction um, as being trapezoidal in an axial scanner and more Gaussian like in a, a helical scanner. So. If we want to characterize a Gaussian, we know we can use parameters like the full width half maximum and the full width tenth maximum. And ideally, we want our slice sensitivity profile to be a box shape, which would have the same full width half max and full width tenth max. Those two parameters would be equal. Clearly, we don't have that box shape um, because of scatter and the, uh, the divergence from the uh, penumbra. So we have a configuration that looks something like this. Now, if we want to measure that uh, in an axial con configuration of a scanner, we can just use two crossed pieces of metal and scan those. In a helical scanner, things get slightly more complicated, and what we use is a delta phantom, which is a, a small metal disc. Uh, imagine just a, a, a coin, a, a very, very thin coin. And that translates across on the patient bed. We reconstruct uh, uh, very fine, very high resolution reconstructions as we've scanned the uh, delta phantom um, through the slice of interest. And then we can look at the distribution. And here we can see some characterizations of the distribution. So we know if, if we're asking the scanner to have a, a, a given slice thickness, um, we can then look at the reconstructions as we've uh, set that configuration, scan the system, and look at what the actual distribution is that we get back. Uh, we know clearly the slice sensitivity profile must vary with slice thickness, but it also varies with pitch. Um, now, these distributions are shown for a single slice scanner. Uh, in these lectures, we don't really talk about single slice scanners anymore because they're never used. But um, we, the only context where we talk about them is when we simplify a problem uh, down in order to describe the physics and then build up to the multi-slice configuration. So we know that for a multi-slice scanner, um, there's evidence that uh, because we have uh, multiple readings across multiple detector channels, we can do some sophisticated interpolation and therefore pitch is no longer a significant factor in the variation of the slice sensitivity profile. So we can open up our corkscrew um, without significantly affecting our slice sensitivity profile. Obviously we, we can see at the larger extremes of the pitch um, suddenly the, uh, the slice sensitivity profile doesn't sl stay flat anymore and starts to increase again as we have shown for the single slice scanning configuration. Now Cone beam CT, as I said, is an extreme of multi-slice helical with the addition of a flat panel detector. There are several important uh, factors that we need to discuss, uh, one of which clearly is that as you open up the uh, detector, so we now have effectively a square-shaped flat panel detector, we're as large in Z as we are in the XY plane, uh, which therefore means we're going to have a lot more scatter.
uh, and a lot more scatter means a lot more noise which means a lot less soft tissue contrast uh, which is a key reason why uh, cone beam CT is often used in uh, maxillofacial exams or, or regions where we've got reasonably dense structures uh, because you uh, region uh, applications where soft tissue contrast is not critically important are uh, very good for cone beam CT because of the speed of the acquisition. So we'll see later on that um, some applications of uh, cone beam CT are uh, uh, have extended beyond uh, maxillofacial and bony regions um, because of the speed and sometimes even though we lose a bit of the soft tissue contrast because we can uh, ramp up the speed of acquisition then applications for which we would have uh, had some uh, blurring due to patient motion where we want to do things quickly uh, are, are, can also be uh, useful in cone beam CT. So one of the key problems with cone beam, cone beam CT, apart from scatter, is also the cone beam artifact. Now, if you think about the, uh, the configuration of a scanner, in the XY configuration, uh, we open up the uh, scanner to have a, a large arc, but we sample uh, around the uh, um, cylindrical geometry of the CT scanner, and therefore can... Um, oversample the data and account for the fact that we have this large arc. But in the Z direction, this the V shape, um, because of the nature of the cylindrical geometry, doesn't do the oversampling in the same way. And we have this um, football shaped region on the right hand side here, where we have good sampling of the data, but outside of that region, we don't have good sampling of the data, and therefore that data can't be reconstructed properly. So we have um, what's called cone beam artifacts, which gives this haloing effect um, at uh, boundaries between uh, changes in tissue type. So if we go from soft tissue to dense tissue, at that boundary, because of the uh, extreme angles involved in cone beam CT, um, when we get that step change, that's a really high frequency change, and the sampling can't keep up with that, and therefore we end up with this uh, haloing effect. So to summarise, we've discussed the scan volume for axial and helical CT, some of the applications and, and their differences, uh, and then gone on to discuss cone beam CT and some of the issues that we encounter there. So we're going to discuss all this in more detail and go through uh, challenge activities in uh, the classes. Um, and that brings us to the end of this section.